I have never played a Zelda game. In fact, most of my knowledge on the series either comes from Super Smash Bros or Point Crow videos. So when Tears of the Kingdom came out, I was curious and wanted to try it out for myself. There obviously was minor confusion at first since the game is a sequel to Breath of the Wild, but it pretty easily wears off and it's not long before I start having fun. He lives! Never mind. He's sleeping. Oh. Placed his faith in you. I don't know who that is. Who? Who are you? Wait, so I'm just narrow from Devil May Cry. The game offers a compelling introduction, establishing a reason for Link's progression from the prior game to reset for gameplay purposes, as well as creating an immediate goal of saving Zelda and defeating this guy. It's actually pretty beginner friendly, as it doesn't require a foundation from the prior game to understand, which allows us to pretty easily enjoy our progression into gameplay without much confusion. Oh, this is cool. Where are we dropping, boys? And after a breathtaking view, we dive headfirst into what this game has to offer, and I have a feeling it's going to be a great one. Oh. Two seconds earlier. I could still use that. Is it gone forever? What? Damn. Game ended. Despite the game only being in a seemingly tutorial area, it offers a beautiful scenery to explore and very quickly get lost in. I'm already lost. <laughs> the game just started and I'm lost. I real I will say, I love the overwhelming feeling. It is a great experience. Along the way, we also finally get to experience combat, and it goes just about Ow. as well as you think it would. Ow. Back off. Ow. Oh. Damn. This is my toughest challenge yet. I win. As we get a hold of the mechanics and the gameplay loop of puzzles, combat, and exploration, a sort of honeymoon-like experience blossoms as we become curious on what else the game can do. What is that? It's like a guardrail. Can I like Sonic grind rail? <laughs> I have discovered fire. I'm too good at this game. Nothing can kill me. He's got a weapon. Put the weapon down. Nothing. Oh. Oh my goodness, the robot is armed with a weapon. Whoa, this is a cool loading screen. Tips and tricks. Get better. This looks beautiful though. Wow. This sunset's gorgeous. I love the sky. The sky is like my favorite thing in the real world and I love it when it's portrayed really well in video games. So literally just being in the sky is awesome. Backgrounds are some of my favorite visuals in video games, and I'd be lying if I wasn't drawn to the game by the fact that you're able to explore these sky islands and get beautiful scenery like this. It's genuinely amazing to see what this game can show. We make our way to our first shrine, and shrines early on act as a sort of tutorial, introducing the power of the runes as well as the application and utility of other mechanics throughout the game. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> and the music in these sections are absolutely phenomenal. This music though is really cool. Composer veterans Manaka Kataoka, Yasuaki Iwata, and Hajime Okai provide amazing tracks for this game as well as its first installment with returning sound composers Takuro Yasuda and Ryu Tamura, and arrangements from Soshi Abe, it results in an entire team of stacked artists combining their efforts to make a stellar soundtrack. What is this? Amiibo? Where? Let me plug in my Mewtwo, my Shadow Mewtwo real quick, see if that works. Don't leave me! Don't leave me! No! No! Come back! Come back! Come back! Oh! Ah. My greatest enemy. Myself. So I don't want to hear myself. Ah! Ah! Okay. I'm dead.
Bro, you fell off. Can you yes. climb up? Climb up there. Can you climb? Instead of building the raft, can you climb up there? Yes. Climb up under the pillar. Oh. Can you shoot? Can you shoot right onto that? Oh, I think you'll. I think you'll be very pleased. <laughs> this is cool. Let's go. Boat stick. <laughs> Sail stick. Oh, whoa! I could blow wind. There we go. Oh, hi, Link. Jump scare. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Open up chest. I am here. Oh, he hurt his foot because I don't have shoes on. Oh, that's an amazing attention to detail. That's so funny. This entire game has an incredible amount of polish as the game seemingly finished development relatively early. It was given the opportunity of nearly a year's worth of time to polish a physics engine, animations, sound design, as well as many other aspects of the game. And it definitely shows. We get a taste of this as the physics engine and level design allows us to tackle puzzles in the most meathead way possible. If one won't work, then how about three? Please work. Yo! No! No! Alright. Momentum! Oh my god! Oh! Ah! Oh! Oh, that was cool. Ow. That was, I was terrifying. I truly appreciate how there isn't simply one correct way to solve puzzles in this game. Another area where the polish shines is in the mob behavior. Whether it's wildlife choosing between a fight or flight response or mobs interacting with each other, the game does a terrific job at creating moments like this. Oh, they fight each other. Which side? Place your bets. Blues or the greens? Gang warfare. The greens have the numbers advantage. The blues are- Oh! Oh! The skillful dodge! Oh, damn. Didn't matter. And then he turned on him. <laughs> oh, shit! I died! You died? <laughs> on the topic of mobs, the enemy designs so far have been remarkable as well. We go from humanoid combative robots to RPG staple slimes to- Damn, Meltan looking different. And even Eldritch Horrors, which will probably keep me up at night. And let me remind you, this is just the tutorial. Uh, no! Yes! Ah! No! Oh, but that does! Ah! 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 Link, balance! Right. Yeah, okay, just stand, just stand. You got it, you got it. You don't need to defend, you don't need to defend. Okay, well, maybe don't stand so close to the... <laughs> Wait, Isaiah, you, you gotta land. Isaiah, you have to land. What are you doing? What are you doing? You have to land, bro. Remember, you can step on a wing. Oh! About he that. Did it. He technically did oh it. Oh my god! That was the worst way to do it. We're four hours in the game? We were at two hours like 30 seconds ago. Oh! I get it. She's crying. Tears of the king. I'll see myself out. Let's ignore that terrible joke for a second and pay attention to the fact that my camera died at the worst possible moment. <laughs> Bro! Hey, they made that item from Smash into a real thing. <sighs> What? What? Am I just bad? Oh, I have to hold. I'm stupid. Reading challenge. Impossible. <laughs> Me fixing my diamond sword. As the mystery to Zelda's disappearance builds, the tutorial that hardly even felt like one comes to an end, but only after encapsulating the heart of this game, and that is to explore the fantastical mysteries of the world. And with that, we descend off of the Sky Island and start our journey by entering Hyrule. I can... Let's go? Can I build a car? 
What better way to start our journey than by building a car? All right, watch this. Oh my God. Oh no. Oh. <laughs> oh, I don't like the way this is going. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Along the way to the castle, we find a giant chasm with dangerous miasma just begging to be explored. What is this? But you know what they say. Curiosity killed the cat. Geronimo. Uh, please what is, what is this? Oh. What is this abyss? Dude, I'm in like Minecraft right now. Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> As we head closer to the castle, we find more construction material and eventually look out landing. And wow, does this game truly feel lived in. Upon passing the guards using rusted weapons, we find access to a room functioning as a Zonai research reception, as well as stables for outgoing citizens. There's a store that offers food and clothing, as well as a well that's being constructed, which you can find fully built later on. And don't even get me started on the training arena where they have instructions for the citizens to follow and you can actually see them practicing there at different points in the day. Even down to the very structure with a north, east, west and south exit, it all comes together. There's also Robbie's research area and an emergency shelter with characters that explain the situations transcending around the world as well as a chef for the shelter. And there's even an entire plot point about how this one sweeper accidentally breaks the wall and it leads to this grand underground labyrinth full of enemies and treasure. Overall, I'm just amazed with how much they were able to put into this one village. It truly feels like a lot of thought went into it. She's what pretty. Exactly happened? After meeting Pura, we head towards Hyrule Castle. And that silence says everything. The complete lack of music powerfully demonstrates the destruction that took place here, as well as showing the reconstruction efforts to fix the disaster. But this all changes once we reach the gates of Hyrule Castle. The piano sets the tone completely. The dead trees, the great coloration as a stark contrast to everything we've seen so far in the game, and the enormous castle floating in the sky. You truly do feel the impact of your failure to protect Hyrule. And to make matters worse, I get a blood moon? <laughs> Whoa. What the fuck? The sky is becoming red. Witness the blood moon's rise. What a scene to demonstrate the ferocity of Ganon's might. Which is why it's only fitting that the next scene returns to those light greens and yellows, as if to showcase that there's still hope, with Zelda somewhere lost, still waiting for us. On a brighter note, afterwards, we get a really cool sequence of the lookout towers activating, as well as an amazing map loading sequence that fully allows us to see the world and decide which direction we want to go. I choose to re-explore the depths and wow, what an amazing buildup as you descend into the depths. You feel the intensity as the soundtrack booms. And once you get there, it truly feels overwhelming. Whether it's the otherworldly vegetation, the insects, the floating will-o'-wisps, or skeleton horses, and statues and mysterious silhouettes. There's just so much that it has to offer and it feels amazing how much they were able to put into this. And the entire time you're immersed in darkness with the only safe haven being these light roots to brighten up the area. Dude, there's like three maps in this game. There's the sky area, there's the depths, and there's like the actual overworld. Like, this is huge. And even when you light up the area, the difficulty is still present as they're empowered by koblins that litter the depths. Oh my god, he's huge. Ouch. My skill just simply isn't enough, 
so I had to use multiple resources just to take out one base. And what makes this funny is that I quite literally was ahead of myself as by returning to the village, we activated a quest to explore the depths. Nice. What the? I saw that statue. Dude, the way the loading screen shows you moving from one location to the other, that's so cool. It's so simple, but it's just, it provides some form of entertainment in such a small waiting period. And I really appreciate that. Oh. Wait, did I completely skip this glowing part and go to a completely different one? Yes, I did. Anyways, one photo later, the game encourages us to head towards Rito Village. So we do. And in the process, we find this weird blue rabbit heading towards this cave. But instead, we find... What the heck is that? I think so, bro. Um... They're multiplying... <laughs> Alright. Take this to the face. I don't want to stop playing, dude. I gotta do things later on today, but... I feel like uh -huh. I'm at the start of like a great adventure. And I really don't want to stop. Ooh, that's a good picture. We occasionally find these little sign quests spread out across the world. So we so we decide to flex our... So we decide to... <laughs> Can I fucking speak? So we decide to flex our building skills. Got it. Perfect. We got paid. I got 25 bucks. Dinner's on me, guys. I'm cool. Oh, I bought dinner too. What the? Trees! They can move! The trees are fighting back. Team Trees. Mr. Beast has had enough. He's arming the trees himself. Gustav Well. Ooh, I don't think I want to go down there. But braver men than me have gone into uncharted territories. So I shouldn't feel fear. Ah, I feel fear! I've solved the mystery on how to escape. Ooh, let's go! It worked! Ingenuity paid off. Along the way, we find a base that piques our interest. Oh, there's a ball! Ball in! Oh, dude. He's decked out. What is this? Going through the Bacoblin base is truly an experience, not because of its difficulty, but because of the versatile and complex nature of the base itself. Like the structure of the base is extremely well built as they have lookout vantage points around the base, as well as a booby trapped entrance with an archer positioned on top. And the enemy variety of an armored version, as well as a leader enemy that you have to fight together, combined with the fact that you can find food and containers around the base, and an armory and treasury as well as a prisoner in the back it just overall truly makes the place feel real dude i just love how it feels real not real in the sense that like it's realistic real in the sense as in i can actually imagine a world that functions this way like i feel like this game is just so brilliantly designed to emulate a real fantastical setting just pure fantasy, and I love that. Afterwards, we head towards the edge of our explored map, and we find a boss blocking our path on a bridge. Oh no, I fell! What is he doing? Where is he going? What is he doing? He's gone. Dude, he's having a trip right now. Kill him, he's so close. Let's go! No, I didn't want to use it, but it seems like I have to, so. We eventually make our way to our first stable. And an aspect that I love about it is the interactivity at this pit stop. We do a quest for a horse and to gather some repairs, as well as feed a dog who then brings us to some treasure. He's a hungry boy, dude's eating like he's never eaten before. <laughs> let him grub, let him grub. And we even hear information about what's currently going on in Rito and the struggle that they're having there. There's also this seemingly unimportant person who offers a main quest that you can completely miss. 
I didn't forget you. The thing forgot us. <laughs> it tells us some interesting lore on the Zonai people, as well as the green lines scattered across the world. All right, I'll be back, horse. Oh my god! Oh my god! There's so much in here. Again, I have to reiterate how amazing the sheer variety of enemy design there is in this game. There are caves infested with horriblins, mini bacoblin camps that become battle taluses. What? That require you to use skills to get atop of it and destroy its weak spot. Or how about burning trees? Or lightning wizards that can summon thunderstorms? Or even this? What is that? What are those? The hands! Los Maros! What? Oh my god. Dude, what what do I do? Well. <laughs> and the music. It's extraordinary. But it's not my favorite enemy so far. As that goes to the boss Bacoblin and his six lackeys. The boss Bacoblin can put them in three formations. Defense, ranged, and melee. While in defense, the boss goes on offense, swinging his sword and throwing rocks. In ranged, the regular Bacoblins throw rocks, and if one has an elemental choo-choo, they'll throw that instead. This is a great opportunity to shoot the boss. In melee, the goons swing in a rotating pattern, which if spaced out allows you to pick them off. And if you disorient the boss in any sort of way, it breaks up the entire formation and they fight individually. It's a really fun enemy to go up against and it leads to a lot of really funny moments like this. Horse, horse! Oh! After claiming another part of the map, I found myself saying this again. Dude, I don't want to stop playing this game. This is so fun. Look, like, look! This is so cool, dude. What the? Where did that come from? Excuse me? What? Why did a rock fall from the sky? You've heard of raining cats and dogs. Now it's raining rocks and pebbles. Boom! We eventually get a new horse and name it New Horse. How original. And we get sidetracked pretty easily by... I will follow anything that looks interesting. Such as that star that fell from the sky. We claim it and mess around some more. All right, so I don't think, oh my God. My horse just did like a mega boost. We also rediscover second grade science. Oh, oh that's cool. I don't know if this will work. However, I'm going to try. <sighs> this game might as well be called Legend of Zelda Forget Ascend with how often I forget it. See? Dude, we're all set. This thing is not falling. This is the worst contraption I've ever built. Okay, but if it works, I'm a genius. I'm a genius. <laughs> Tears truly allows you to showcase not only how creative, but dumb our ideas can be, and I love every aspect about that. This is so funny. <laughs> Damn. Whoa. That's so cool. There are genuinely so many times where the game just does something and all you really want to do is just sit there and watch it play out because it's beautiful. <laughs> That's a beautiful picture. Wow. Dude, even like the sound of the rain hitting the tarp from like your hand glider. That, that is an amazing attention to detail. All right, let me get under the hood real quick. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> he's, a, he's a mechanic. Now I shall ride into battle. Fight me, wild beasts. <laughs> this is a mess. He dodged it. 
<laughs> what are you? So stupid. Hello. What are you doing? <laughs> Your horse is not keeping it up, bro. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> oh! <laughs> it almost Don't worked. Tell me do not tell me it worked. I'm gonna make it work. <laughs> Yo! <laughs> Who needs to build? My horse can do everything. How are you gonna? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I'm a genius. Kit, you're a genius. You're a genius. <laughs> Throughout our travels, there are also several mini games, such as this game of catch that I really suck at. <laughs> Hold on, do it again. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> oh! <laughs> no! <laughs> what? I touched that. I touched that too. Wait, it fell out. Eventually though, I get the hang of it. Stay in. Let's go. Let's go. And then there's the car building one, which I thoroughly enjoyed a lot. Wait, what the fuck? What are those wheels doing? That's not what I wanted them to do. I don't know. There's something really addictive about finding an error in your building, improving it, and getting a higher score afterwards, and then repeating that process over and over and getting farther and farther every time. It's just such a rewarding experience. Wow. I literally like almost doubled my entire points. Did my horse just jump? My horse got stuck in a hole. <laughs> yeah, you can say no. Yeah, your horse is done for. I see. What the fuck is that? What is that? What is that? Yeah, Flame Gleok? Again, I just have to praise the enemy design as it continues to surprise me and I really enjoy how the game creates an organic means of difficulty as not only is the beast extremely powerful, but you just don't have the equipment required to fight it at this point. Before playing this game, I was aware of the discourse with this and Breath of the Wild's durability system, but I think that this is an example of one of the benefits as it gives the player the choice to either exhaust all of their weapons in a long tedious challenge over and over, or to backtrack and return with stronger equipment later on in the game. The game gives you the ability to do both, but encourages retracking to prior areas, giving the player a desire to return, and even potentially discover something they missed along the way, and for that reason I see it as an overall positive. Oh my god, that's so menacing! And so we decide to run. Speaking of discovery, this game does a wonderful job of getting you to see something, stop, and then head towards it. There are several times when I'll be heading towards one area only to get sidetracked by something along the way, and as I explore that area, I find another place of interest. And what do you know, a 5 minute horse ride becomes an hour of exploration. And the best part about all of this is the game rewards you for this exploration. If there's something interesting, chances are you'll find something that makes it worth pursuing. That's addictive game formula done right. Let's go! Okay, let's see, how do we get inside? I believe that was uh, oh, What did that do? Oh, it's a bomb! It's a bomb! <laughs> oh my god! Did I check that? What the fuck? There we go. Let's see. Building a bridge isn't that hard. Oh! Oh! No! That's not what I wanted to do, but we still accomplished it. Duck. <laughs> this is Resident Evil. What's it? Um, um, this is actually Resident Evil. Wait. Whoa. <laughs> oh no. After a couple of shrines, we make our way to Hebra, and our first goal is to help this guy with the signpost in the dumbest way possible. Stability. Mm -hmm. I have three sides touching the floor. 
Nope. <laughs> we did it. We did it. That is terrible. What the fuck is this? <laughs> we did it. What <laughs> we did done? We did it. <laughs> we did it. This is garbage. It worked. What even is this supposed to be? <laughs> we did it. That's all that mattered. What was the goal here? With the bridge to Rito destroyed, I somehow missed this lady's solution to get across it and decide instead to build a bridge. I fucked up. He died. Fall damage. Fall it's complicated. Damage. Hmm. I feel like I remember saying it was easy. Building a bridge isn't that hard. Two minutes later, barely moving my Joy-Con. <laughs> We did it! We finally arrive at Rito Village, and the first structure shown rewards our exploration for shrine hunting, and in my case, mispronouncing. Makurikis, Makurukis. Runa Kit. Mayu, Maya Umekis. Kyo no no. Kyo no nis. <laughs> Gotta kiss. Sina Kawak. Taki Ihaban. Ihaban. Sahiro Shrine. Jokes aside, this functions as a great way to reward the player, while also preparing them for the upcoming trial as we progress the story. That's not fair at all! You know I can handle it! If we don't do anything, the village... Huh? Is that you? It is you! In order to save Rito, we must first help an eager Tulin to reclaim his bow, which puts us in a really cool set piece. Air Raid. <laughs> That's cool. Having a companion during these story missions really helps them stand out. They built a wall to stop them from fighting each other. That's funny. Let them fight. Who will win? Oh, headshot! Oh, oh, they're getting murdered. This was a slaughter. Oh my God. Yo, this is violent. I got to put an end to this. You hear the sound design? Like just the eerie feeling of like the echoing violin. It's so good. Like that bell. I am in love with the soundtrack, as well as like just the entire sound design for this game. It's very impressive. <laughs> I tried. All right, watch this. Nope. Never mind. Okay. Okay. Parkour. All right. Try it now, sir. Hopefully, it doesn't fall. Oh, I didn't think about that. Putting the rock on the plank of the floor. We did it. You know, Claude, your idea was smarter, but my idea was dumber and it worked. So who's the real genius? <laughs> the sky pillars are next as we ascend. Well, we would ascend if I remembered to. I have to climb. The next part was absolutely the highlight of the game, as we take on a raging storm and climb towering pillars, fighting flux constructs, aerial monsters, as well as zonai machines, sometimes all at the same time. Even the terrain itself isn't safe, as the floor is constantly crumbling. Oh, 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 okay, okay, it was a mistake, it was a mistake, don't do that again. <laughs> Don't jump. By the time we make it near the top, the storm starts to take a toll on us as the cold goes into the freezing territory, forcing us to back for clothing. Hat. Oh, I'm broke. Okay. Well, time to make money. NASA got nothing on this. Okay. Let's go! Not long after, we return to enter a sea of ships riding amongst the clouds, and we use them to enter the eye of the storm. Are you hearing this? This is actually insane, and again a perfect example of how this game fully utilizes its setting to make some amazing set pieces and locations. <laughs> this is cool. The music. 
This is beautiful. Holy shit. And as the music blares, we enter the Wind Temple, where a labyrinth of puzzles has us using our entire kit and everything we've learned up to this point, whether it's dodging trap doors and cannons, fighting enemies, or using our runes to their fullest capabilities. It's as if the game is celebrating our journey and testing our knowledge that we gained along the way. It's another aspect where I feel this game is rewarding to those who set out to understand the mechanics and have fun with them. I honestly feel that's the best way to describe Tears of the Kingdom. It's rewarding for every action you commit to. You can quite literally learn the lore behind the Song of Stormwind arc, which offers further detail to the temple before you even initiate the story quest. Even when you unlock the gates of the Wind Temple, you're rewarded with... We have opened the gate. What is inside? Insect Dragon, Colgara, Scourge of the Wind Temple. By far the coolest boss enemy yet. The battle itself actually takes an interesting approach, as there are really two ways to tackle it. Either a slower, more defensive playstyle where you dodge its attacks and attack it while it's weak, or a more rushdown offensive style where you destroy its weak spots while it's attacking. Either way, the battle makes for a really fun test of skill, and when phase 2 starts, That's where the challenge truly begins, as you have to use your aerial mobility to its fullest as you're berated with tornadoes. Still, after a couple arrows later, we defeat Colgara. It's the darkness. The darkness that we saw at the beginning of the game. With Colgara's defeat, the Maelstrom is relinquished and the sun returns back to Rito. Tulin, my brave fledgling. I know that voice. It's you. You're the one who's been guiding us? Where you fight, the winds follow. I would expect nothing less from my descendant. You make me proud. Now, the reason I've barely talked about the story isn't because I don't find it interesting or that it might be confusing as a non-Zelda player, but that's not true in the slightest, but rather it was the part of the game I was most surprised by. I've never watched or even seen someone play a full Zelda game, so I had no idea how it tackled its story. As a Pokemon fan, I really enjoy and appreciate a good story, but even the best Pokemon stories realistically aren't the best written. But they all offer a charm, and that's something I see here as well. Maybe Tears of the Kingdom will have an amazing story. I'll have to finish the game to find out, but what I do know now is that what it offers and its character writing is nothing short of great. Having Tulin go from this overly impulsive kid, tired of the slow actions of the Rito, to seeing the consequences of his impulsive behavior and realizing he needs to wait for others, that's in its own right an interesting story. But it's also a story of trust, as his father Teba wants to trust him to be the next leader and go on his own adventure, but worries about his overly hasteful nature. And yet, he still lets him go to the Wind Temple, just trusting that Tulin will grow from the experience, which he does. As he ascends the tower, he hears the calling of someone and trusts that guidance of this mysterious voice. And when they finally meet, it's his ancestor who acknowledges Tulin as the savior of the Rito village. It feels pride in his lineage as the plan Zelda made is starting to come through fruition. And so he places that trust that he had in Zelda in Tulin to help Link defeat Ganon, this time for good. This is that power of friendship that Teba referred to. The trust of others that culminates in a combined strength greater than before. And how does Tulin take this? So it's my mission to fight the Demon King with you? Link! This is so, so amazing! I can't 
can't believe my ancestor gave me such an important mission. And it involves fighting alongside you to save the world. I love this reaction, as it truly shows how he's not only grown, but also takes pride and enjoys his newfound mission. I especially like how once they return to the village, Teba gives Tulin his bow, further establishing that theme of trust. I, Tulin, the Sage of Wind, swear to fight by your side until the end. Take this. It's proof that I'm with you! Overall, I just... I had fun, and that's the best way to put it. I enjoyed the story a lot, and I'm looking forward to see how it progresses. Now the snow is gone, and even though the story for Rito is completed, there's still a lot to do in the village. There's quests, there's interactions, and more. I really appreciate how once you're completed with the story, it's not just a simple move on moment. There's still much more to this, the entire world that you get to explore, and I really, really enjoy that aspect of this game. It feels absolutely huge. Like, despite how far we've gotten in this game in over 20 hours, we've probably only completed like 10% of the game. And that's insane. There's still more quests, there's still more bosses to fight, there's still more areas to explore, more characters to find, mysteries to unravel, villages to find, puzzles, enemies, shrines to mispronounce, wow, shrine, and much, much more. We've really only scratched the surface, and I'm excited to continue. And if you guys enjoyed this video, maybe you can continue with me. I stream over on Twitch, so if you want to just go ahead over there and follow me, go ahead. I'd really enjoy it and I'd love to interact with you guys. In fact, I'm probably streaming right now, so why not come check me out? That being said, thank you all for watching, and I hope you all have a damn good one.